Hi everyone, I'm Ivanka and we are back on Facebook Live. I've been having so much fun with this. I'm so excited to be back again answering some of your questions. This week it's one of my favorite topics, negotiation. So continue to ask your questions. Just write um, in the comment section below. Just shoot them at me. I brought our art director, Katie Hi. Long. Um, who's going to be helping and reading your questions, asking me them real time. We have a couple of others that you've tagged me at Ask Ivanka on Facebook and um, Twitter over the last couple of days. Um, so I'll be starting with those and then getting into some of your questions live. I, I have to say this has been so, so fun. You've asked so many great questions. I needed Katie's help because I couldn't, they were coming in so quickly I couldn't read them in real time. So, so she's going to be curating them for me, but let's get started. So the first question is from Jane on Facebook. How do you prepare for a major negotiation? So I think the key for um, negotiation and, um, and successful preparation is, um, is really getting your ducks in a row. I, I think confidence is so critical and so much of one's success while they're negotiating is how they present themselves, how they present the material and the conviction in which they relay their viewpoint. So preparation is everything. If nothing else, even if it's a quickie, it's a fast negotiation, if you're well researched and you know what you're talking about, it's much harder for somebody to argue against your viewpoint. So I like to go into a major negotiation, really understanding my facts, um, really being up to speed. I found it's been an com incredible competitive advantage for me. I actually find that as people get more successful, they end up doing a little bit less of the work because they have people under them who are doing some of the preliminary research and a lot of that information isn't communicated to them. So sometimes it's actually an advantage when you're younger, a little less experienced, to negotiate with somebody who's more formidable because a lot of times they're not quite as up to speed on, on the topic as you are. But preparation is incredibly important. And then I think just taking a deep breath. I think when you're prepared, you can feel a lot more confident. But you know, I see people and they're waiting to go into a really important meeting, whether it's a job interview, or um, an important uh, transaction negotiation and they're sitting in the waiting room and they're hunched over and they're on their iPhone and they're checking Instagram and I think one of the more important things we can do is sort of sit up straight, breathe deeply, sort of center ourselves for a second and, and then start the process. So um, those are just some little tips but um, I think they're uh, pretty important. I have one. Okay. Um, Amanda on Facebook wants to know, in what ways do you think the internet helps or hinders negotiating? Well, so I think the internet is an unbelievable tool and resource, especially for um, for preparing yourself and for um, gleaning information. You can find and learn a lot about the person you're sitting on the opposite yeah, side of the table right. about. You can learn about the topic, you can do some real research, but I don't like to negotiate digitally. I think it only benefits the weaker party. Okay. It gives people the ability to be very measured in their response. It also opens up the door for misinterpretation of intent. So somebody can send a one-line email that's a very nice, normal response, and the lack of an exclamation mark can make you feel paranoid that it's an authoritative statement. And so yeah. I, I find that there's so much room to misinterpret tone via email. Plus, I think that you're giving a weaker party the benefit really thinking about how they want to respond. And I think one of the most telling things in a negotiation is asking a question and real time seeing how they react. Mm -hmm. You can learn a lot from somebody's body language. Did you make them uncomfortable? Did you unearth sort of a weakness in their argument? And you lose that when you do it, mm -hmm. even telephonically to a lesser extent. But, um, but I think any consequential negotiation should be done in person. Okay. Um, this one's a good one. Ooh. Okay, so we've got Anne on Twitter. How do you keep your personal feelings out of a negotiation? For example, if you really like the person. So like, love. <laughs> this is so. This is one of these um, cases where sometimes there really is a benefit to having an intermediary, and it's why in real estate people will use brokers if they're just not educated on how to transact or if they would prefer not to be the point person. So I do think sometimes there is um, there is a real benefit to having somebody who's the point person and allows you to then come in later and be a little bit softer or come in later and be a little bit more aggressive. Um, so in a case where there are personal feelings, I think that's, um, that's an especially helpful time uh, 
um, to, to, to use somebody to help facilitate those discussions if you feel uncomfortable having them directly. But you know, I think one of the critical things about being a good negotiator is being introspective. So you have to sort of look at a situation and ask, actually ask yourself, am I the best person to be negotiating this transaction? I've had deals over the years where I just haven't had a good chemistry with the person across the table from me. So I've said to one of my brothers, you know what, you will be more effective than I will. And that takes, um, that takes a level of confidence. Um, you can't be an insecure person to remove yourself from a situation. And you may be still pulling the strings behind the scenes, but sometimes you're not the best point person to actually have the discussion and actually articulate the points. So I think that's something that you want to think about as well without ego attached to it, are you the best person to be having the conversation and get the desired result? Okay. Um, I have another one from Twitter. Um, okay. Baba wants to know, how do you leverage when ne the negotiating partner is more knowledgeable on a subject matter? So this is tough, and you never really know. Um, sometimes you know, right? If I'm buying a building, the person who owns the building is more knowledgeable about right. the building than I am. Um, with that said, I think that the best strategy when you're dealing with somebody you assume is more knowledgeable about the subject matter than you are is let them talk first. Because you never want to assume that you know where all the value lies. And I've had situations where I've thought that value is X and it's much, much greater because they know about the potential and what can be done with an asset um, through, through, you know, through a business plan that they've lived with over the course of many years. So when I'm less knowledgeable, I prefer to ask more questions. I prefer to really try and get the person I'm um, on the other side of the table from to, to start talking, and you learn from them. So in, in general, I think the more listening you do during the course of the negotiation, the better. But I think especially when you're, um, when you're less knowledgeable about the topic. Okay, this actually takes me to a personal question. Then. Okay. We just got the budget in from the drywall guy. We have a couple pitches. I know nothing around drywall. How do I know, like, what's the best rate? How do I negotiate this <laughs> down? That's, that's funny. I want to so say we are budget. actually redoing our office space. We're moving into a much larger space. Our business has grown yeah. dramatically, um, which is very exciting. And Katie is doing her first sort of design and construction project. So and I'm learning a lot. <laughs> she wants to ask me about drywall. Yes. Um, but I, I think, you know, when you're bidding on something that's sort of highly transactional like mm -hmm. that, you want multiple quotes. Okay. So how I get comfortable with a number is for, for something, in, particularly in the construction trade, is I'll bid it out to three different drywall guys mm -hmm. um, or girls, the same scope of work, and then they come in with their number, and if they're all coalescing around the same thing, great. Okay. If there's an extreme outlier, you want to understand why. Maybe your scope was wrong, maybe somebody actually, maybe that person's right and the others are, are, are not right. Okay. Um, and you know, it, then you have to decide in some transactions it's really just about price. Okay. In others, quality matters and you're willing to pay a premium. But you don't really, you can't really get a full lay of the land or confidence unless you really understand the industry and what's appropriate yeah. pricing, unless you have multiple options. Okay. So okay. do a little more work. <laughs> <laughs> get a few more bids. <laughs> Okay. Um, so I've got, I've got one from John on Twitter. Okay. When is the best time to walk away from a deal? So you should always be prepared to walk away from a deal that you don't want to transact, that is no longer a good deal. And sometimes that's really hard because you get emotionally invested in the end result and culminating something. Nobody likes to work really hard on a project and not see it through to completion. So I've known people who have done deals that they know aren't good deals any longer. Oh. You know, they've been chiseled away. Yeah. Um, the, the spirit, the intent, or a lot of times through a negotiation, you learn that the person you're negotiating with, who's going to be an ongoing partner, has personality traits that you don't like, that they're not going to be a good partner in the long run. Those are the hardest, where you still like the deal, but you realize the partnership is set up to be flawed. Um, and, and those are tough. So I've walked away from deals that economically would have been very beneficial, but I didn't feel comfortable with the partnership um, and who I was dealing with. So you know, I, I think you, you have to be willing to walk away. You have to constantly make assessments and you have to constantly ask yourself, you know, does this deal still make sense, despite the fact that it always iterates from where you start? Mm -hmm. 
um, and, uh, and, and it takes discipline. Sometimes it's harder to walk away than it is to actually close it. Okay, we only have time for one more question. Okay. Um, the last one comes from Facebook. How do you negotiate with colleagues without damaging relationships? So I think you have to be sensitive. So the, I think the biggest mistake people make when they think about the con when they think about the topic of negotiation is that it's purely transactional. Very few negotiations. Like if I went and bought a used car, mm -hmm. that's purely transactional. I'm probably never going to see the person who sold right. me that car again. So I can go in there as aggressively as I want, get the best price. You know, if I'm calling to negotiate my cable bill, it's about price. Okay. Most negotiations are for contracts that lead to relationships. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times by you know, trying to get every last nickel off the table, you actually damage the relationship and it costs you much, much more in the long run. So I think first and foremost, you have to categorize, you have to categorize negotiations as, is this purely transactional? Or is there a relationship element like dealing with a coworker mm -hmm. where maybe the best thing you can do is actually lose a seemingly oh. irrelevant negotiation right. because it will um, create goodwill for your relationship with that party going forward and they'll be more trustworthy of you um, and they'll be more inclined to collaborate and cooperate with you on an ongoing basis. That's so I think especially point. when you're dealing with colleagues, I would err on the side of sensitivity. I would be um, very forthright with them in terms of what your perspective is. And I would spend a lot of time listening because these are people that you want to understand their perspective. Okay. And if you're negotiating something, don't assume that your viewpoint is right. You know, at least give them the benefit of listening and, and, and getting to a place where you understand their argument as well as your own. Um, and then as a collective, try to, uh, try to um, find an agreeable end result. Okay. So, and I think that's it. It went by so quickly. So this was rapid fire Facebook Live. Um, this was a lot of fun. You can go to my site, yvonnecontrump.com. We've done a ton of posts on negotiation. Oh, it's at the top of the homepage. And it's at the top of the homepage. Um, we have great contributors on the site as well from um, University of Pennsylvania's Warden Business School, Professor Adam Brandt, to Elizabeth McLaughlin, mm -hmm. who have talked about so many different iterations on this topic, how to negotiate a better salary. You're on there too. Yeah, <laughs> I'm on there as well. Um, so uh, we've got a lot of good stuff. So visit IvankaTrump.com, tune in. We're going to do another topic like this. And in the comments below, ask me your questions for what you'd like us to discuss next time. Um, and if you like this format, it's a lot of fun for me, so I enjoy it, and thank you guys for tuning in.